Good evening, everyone. We're going to get started. It's delightful to see everybody in person. Uh, when you're doing a webinar, this doesn't happen. You just start. You know, you have to ask people to get get organized. Good evening. My name is Paul Carice. I'm the director of this school at Arizona State University, the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership. And I'm very glad you could join us for the school's fifth, fifth annual Constitution Day lecture. Uh, this is also the opening event of the school speaker series this year on the theme of renewing America's civic compact. This is our fifth year organizing the series, and the whole series is an effort that we call the Civic Discourse Project. And as I mentioned, we are delighted to be back in person with in-person speaker events after 18 months of doing uh, webinars. So thank you for being here. Thank you for attending. I think you are participating in the renewal of American civic life. So give yourselves a round of applause for, for being here. I am requested to ask that since we are inside a building at ASU, it's recommended that we wear masks, and I, I will put on my mask after I'm done doing my introducing uh, work. Um, as we start uh, these in-purse events in the project, we are happy again to be collaborating with Arizona PBS. You'll see the cameras at the back. Um, they are recording all of our events as they have done in years past. Uh, we are live streaming tonight's event, and then uh, the episodes in the series this year will be available on the school's YouTube channel. And we encourage you actually to look at our website and on our YouTube channel. You can see all of our past uh, four years of events in the Civic Discourse Project, all of our speaker, individual speaker and dialogue events. And the school's website is scetl at asu.edu. Uh, another introductory remark on the theme of civic dis discourse. Uh, we're very happy to have with us tonight uh, several civic leaders from the Phoenix community, and we also have some faculty and staff uh, from other parts of the university. So Senator John Kyle is with us tonight. Um, uh, Judge Bollock of the State Supreme Court, Representative Bollock from the Arizona Legislature, and Senator Boyer from the Arizona Legislature, and if I'm missing anybody else, I, I apologize. But it, it's great that we have members of the community, uh, including leaders in the community, joining us. We've worked really hard for five years now to have a high-level conversation in the Civic Discourse Project uh, to convene differing points of view. Some are individual speaker events like tonight, some are dialogue uh, events. Um, public intellectuals, uh, academics, a range of uh, speakers. This is what we try to do in our classrooms as well, our undergraduate major and our new master's degree, uh, to have reasonable, high-level debate uh, on important topics, uh, important for higher education and also for American society. Um, before I introduce uh, our distinguished speaker for a Constitution Day event, I should say one more thing about the school's efforts on civic education. We think of ourselves as combining liberal arts education and civic education in our classrooms. And in this speaker series, these kinds of speaker events, we also have been very busy the past few years with civics in K-12 schools. And we co-led a national study that was published earlier this year with partners from Harvard and from Tufts and from iCivics. The study was published earlier this year as, as uh, educating for American democracy. So if you're interested in civics education, you can contact us or you can look up the title of that uh, study. Um, and we are now very busy with the school and with the center in the school, the Center for Political Thought and Leadership, in working to implement the ideas from that study in K-12 schools in Arizona and in other states. So now to introduce our uh, speaker. As I mentioned, um, the theme this year in the Civic Discourse Project is renewing America's civic compact. Uh, this is also, as I mentioned, our annual Constitution Day lecture for 2021. And as we all know, we are just a few days away from commemorating the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks on America in 2001. So for all of these reasons, we are very fortunate to have an experienced guide uh, tonight to talk with us on the topic of patriotism, our most contested virtue. Stephen Smith has taught at Yale University since 1984 
and he, he is the Alfred Coles Professor of Political Science. He also is the co-director of the Yale Center for the Study of Representative Institutions, which focuses on the theory and practice of representative government in the Anglo-American world. Stephen is the author or editor of many books, including studies of Hegel, Spinoza, Leo Strauss, Abraham Lincoln, and most recently, Isaiah Berlin. His uh, series of lectures on the introduction to political philosophy was one of the pioneering courses in Yale's online series, and that's uh, been viewed by many students around the world and also published as a separate book. His most recent book, which is the basis of his remarks tonight, is Reclaiming Patriotism in an Age of Extremes. And it's been highlighted in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and the Washington Post. I'll just mention a few of the prizes, uh, two prizes that he's received, academic prizes. The Ralph Waldo Emerson Prize given by Phi Beta Kappa, which is the National Political Science Honor Society. And Yale's Lex Hickson Prize for Teaching Excellence in the Social Sciences. Since he'll, he'll be talking about loyalty tonight, I should mention that his official biography also states that he is a diehard Yankees fan, and he hopes to be able, <clears throat> he hopes to, be able to play for the team in his next life. <laughs> That's what he says. So our format for tonight is that uh, Stephen will talk for about 40 minutes, and then in the second part of the program, as you can see from the chairs, I'll interview him uh, with some very tough questions. Uh, and then in the third part, uh, we will bring a microphone into the center aisle and we'll have time for uh, questions from the audience. So with that, please join me in welcoming Stephen Smith. Uh, I think maybe after that introduction, I should just bow out and go home because I won't live up, live up to all of that. But thank you, Paul, for those, uh, those words. And most of all, I want to thank everybody here for showing up for this. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here at ASU uh, and also to be speak to, and as I today and yesterday learn, learning about this, this Skettle program and uh, you're doing God's work, Paul. I have to say, this is a, an amazing program. I had lunch today with uh, some students. We had a very interesting, very good conversation over issues of civic life, liberal education, meaning of life, many other small topics like that. And uh, it's just inspiring to, to be here and see the work that's being done here, here on the campus. So. And it's also a special pleasure. This is, uh, well, it's a pleasure to be here, also an honor to be your first in-person speaker. This is also the first in-person event I've done since uh, COVID. So it's a first all the way around. Anyway, <clears throat> let me get to the, the, my uh, words for tonight. Mention the word patriot or patriotism on a university campus or in educated circles, and you are likely to hear Samuel Johnson's barb that patriotism is the last refuge of a scoundrel. Sometimes you might hear George Bernard Shaw's quip that patriotism is the belief that your country is best because you were born there. And sometimes you might even hear E.M. Forster's observation when he said if he had to betray his country or his friend, he said he hoped he would have the guts to betray his country. They have some good lines on their side, I must say. Uh, this is hardly to say, however, that patriotism on the verge of disappearance. But it has also come to seem ethically challenged in today's climate of cancel culture and political correctness. In fact, once you leave any urban environment, it is not difficult at all to find people with no reservations at all about love of country and are willing to express it on the bumper stickers on their cars or trucks and bars and diners and in houses of worship. The problem is that the country they profess to love is often at odds with what many of us would find welcoming. 
It is often insular, exclusionary, and intolerant. So given this dilemma, what is a liberal and a patriot to do? This was the dilemma I found myself in when I began to write this book, Reclaiming Patriotism in an Age of Extremes. I must admit that one of the secret pleasures I had in writing the book was the look of ex the expressions of shock, of horror, and occasionally disgust on the faces of colleagues when I told them I was writing a book in defense of patriotism. All I can say is that I wear their contempt as a badge of honor. But first of all, let's turn to some definitions. The idea that we share a common history held together by a collective memory is the source of the disposition we call patriotism. This is an old, even an ancient term. The word goes back to the Greek word patris, or place of one's ancestors, and probably more famously to the Latin patria, or fatherland. Broadly associated with love of country, the idea of patriotism raises many questions. Like every form of love, patriotism is partly determined by the object of its affection. To make us love our country, Edmund Burke wrote in his reflections on the revolution in France, to make us love our country, our country ought to be lovely. But what if it isn't? Then what? Is love of country unconditional, as in the expression, my country right or wrong? Or is it dependent on our countries meeting certain standards of conduct? And again, what then if it doesn't? There is also the question of what makes love of country an admirable sentiment. In his famous funeral oration, Pericles exhorts his fellow Athenians to, as he says, feed your eyes upon Athens until love of her fills your heart. Does love of country as this form of almost erotic attachment force us to ignore the flaws in the beloved? Uh, do we become like Pygmalion who fell in love with his own creation? The political philosopher Hannah Arendt once wondered whether it is even possible to love an abstraction like a nation or a country composed of millions and millions of people one could never meet. Isn't love something we can only express toward individuals? These are some of the questions I take up in my book and that I want to explore in part with you this afternoon. Patriotism has always been a contested virtue. Why? Because it must contest with other loyalties that we have to family, to friends, to tribe, to religion. As any reader of Sophocles' Antigone would immediately recognize, the conflict between loyalty to family and loyalty to state is as old as Western literature. In the case of the virtually inevitable conflict of loyalties, it is not clear which side should take priority. Patriotism has always been a contested virtue, but modern patriotism is different because it finds itself with different alternatives in vying that vie for predominance. These I want to call nationalism and multiculturalism. We might consider patriotism uh, in the way that Aristotle considered the virtues. I always go to Aristotle for quest answers of questions of this sort. He gives the best advice. Aristotle said, all the virtues are a mean, a kind of midpoint between extremes of excess and deficiency. He considered every virtue liable to certain kinds of derangements or distortions. And I want to consider today nationalism and multiculturalism as two extremes, you might say the two distortions or pathologies from which we must begin to disentangle patriotism. On the right, the political right, patriotism must be distinguished from nationalism. And a large part of the book is given over to 
clarifying what I mean by that, by that distinction. Nationalism and patriotism initially grew out of, grow out of a legitimate desire for self-determination, to have oneself and one's way of life strong and respected. But over time, they have moved in different, taken different paths. Nationalism has morphed into an ideology of grievance and resentment. It has become a weapon for determining who is in and who is out, who is the real American and who is not. Nationalist stories are typically narratives of treason and betrayal by unscrupulous elites in which listeners or readers are encouraged to feel contempt for fellow citizens who fall outside the dominant group. Nationalists seek the warmth of community, but always at the expense of an outgroup who are deemed un-American, traitorous, and enemies of the people. Nationalism thrives on this language of friend and enemy, and it is impossible without it. On January 6th, the groups shouting patriots to the front were, in my view, guilty of a gross misuse of the term patriotism. The idea of overturning an election is not an expression of patriotism, but a distortion of it. On the left, however, the critique of patriotism is undertaken from a different angle by multiculturalism and what in college environments refer to as identity politics. Multiculturalism was in originally an academic theory that simply sought to give vo voice to previously underrepresented minorities, women, African Americans, gays. But over time, this has morphed into a race, a kind of arms race for victim status and suggesting a far-ranging critique of American history. Critical race theory, which has its source in law schools, but has recently endorsed by the New York Times 1619 Project, dates the American founding from the time when 20 African slaves were sold to the Jamestown colony in Virginia. In this account, American history, even the American Revolution itself is presented, is based on persistent racial oppression and white supremacy. Although these claims have been widely repudiated by many of our best historians, they continue to gain traction in public schools and universities. Such a view is based on a radical simplification and reduction of all American history to a single theme. It overlooks the fact that, for example, even at the time of the American founding, the institution of slavery was highly contested. The original draft of the Declaration of Independence included a pointed denunciation of the slave trade as a practice incompatible with the rights of man. Benjamin Franklin and Alexander Hamilton were the heads of abolitionist societies in Pennsylvania and New York, and so on and so on. From our beginnings, slavery was a contested institution, and to pretend that the defense of white supremacy is the one constant running throughout our history is false to the fact of our national experience. One reason I cannot accept this view of America as a white supremacist nation is that it denies the efforts of generations of Americans, both black and white, in their struggle to achieve a more perfect union. Slavery may be an irreparable stain on America, but it is not the essence of America. So where is patriotism in this debate that we're having? Let me go back to definitions. Patriotism, as I said earlier, is a form of love or loyalty. We admire loyalty to family, to friends, to sports teams, even institutions up to a point. Yet loyalty also sits uneasily with other qualities that we equally admire, qualities like fairness, justice, mercy, equality, and open-mindedness. These do not always sit easily together. There seems to be 
something primitive, almost primordial about loyalty, almost like the kind of mafia code of omerta. But loyalty, I want to argue, is the first virtue of social institutions. A famous philosopher at Harvard, John Rawls, opened his important book, The Theory of Justice, saying justice is the first virtue of social institutions. So I say loyalty is the first virtue of institutions. Without it, our collective life could not last for a single day. Loyalty is an affirmation of what we care about. And our cares are not momentary whims or desires, but more like a structure of commitments. We are loyal to the things we care about, and we care about those to whom or to which we remain loyal. Our cares make our lives more than a series of discrete and disconnected events in time, but provide a sense of wholeness and meaning. What we care about defines the kinds of persons we are or wish to be. Loyalty is a virtue of character. It's when we say of someone, or when someone says, I've got your back, or when we describe someone as a stand-up guy. It means that's someone I can count on. That's someone who cares. Whether loyalty is hardwired into our biological makeup, as some social psychologists have argued, or whether it is some kind of litmus test for determining or for distinguishing, rather, conservatives who are said to value loyalty to particular groups from liberals who ostensibly value more universal causes, is irrelevant for my purpose today. Loyalty is inseparable from our nature as political animals, and we cannot function well without it. Patriotism is a form of loyalty, but a particular form, a form of what I want to call constitutional loyalty. It is not simply a loyalty to the people of the United States, but a loyalty to a particular constitutional order, what we might call a liberal democracy or a constitutional democracy. Our Pledge of Allegiance, for example, is an oath to the flag and to the republic for which it stands. At the core of our national pledge is a devotion to republican government. This already stakes a claim. Our patriotism is not a kind of blind loyalty based on blood and soil but it is commitment to a form of government, a republic, or today what we would probably more usually call a democracy. Our patriotism is uniquely constitutional in form. A change of constitution, which is different from just a change of administrations, but a change of constitutions would require a change of loyalty. A fascist or a communist America would no longer be the regime established by the constitution and therefore would no longer seem as the, as the basis of loyalty. It would be the same country, but it would be a different America. American patriotism is in many ways unique, like America. It is uniquely a patriotism of ideas. We are and have been from our beginnings a people of the book, or maybe I should say a people of books. The Puritans thought of themselves as creating a city on the hill, a new Jerusalem in the wilderness of New England. This is why the Hebrew Urim Vitumim, which is somewhat ludicrously translated as light and truth, uh, is on the seal of the university where I teach. The constitutional framers, the authors of the first written constitution, followed in their footsteps, attempting to create a, t a text that would stand the test of time. From our beginnings, <clears throat> ours has been <clears throat> excuse me, a patriotism rooted in ideas, and no idea was more important than the idea of equality given voice in the Declaration of Independence, and no one has put greater emphasis on that concept than our greatest patriot, Abraham Lincoln.
I have never had a feeling politically that did not spring from the sentiments embodied in the Declaration of Independence. Those were Lincoln's words to an audience in Constitution Hall on his way to the White House in February of 1861. Lincoln tried to teach that our principles are not the property of one people or one race to be hoarded and jealously conserved. His writings continually emphasize the open and inclusive character of the American Republic in contrast to the nativists and nationalists of his period. The American Republic, <clears throat> he argued, is not defined by religion, race, or ethnic identity, but by adherence to the principles of rights embodied in the Declaration itself. He offered an enlarged reading of the Declaration's language as applying to a broader segment of mankind than those of British descent uh, already here in 1776. Lincoln's inclusive conception of American life took the immediate form of opposition to the nativist and anti-immigrant policies of the American party, known as the Know Nothings. In a speech in Chicago, he noted that those who can trace their bloodlines back directly to the founding generation grow smaller over time. But rather than deplore that fact, Lincoln used the occasion to welcome those of recent ancestry to the table. He added this judgment to this, a judgment, a belief that it is important to, to remove obstacles or weights, as he called them, to their enjoyment of the rights of equal citizenship. This language of lifting weights and burdens from the shoulders of men and women clearly connects Lincoln's language back to the Puritan notion of a calling and a quest for salvation from the burdens of original sin. However, for Lincoln, the original political sin was slavery and inequality, and the mission of the American Republic was release from that fallen condition. For Lincoln, American patriotism was never a complacent satisfaction with what we are but an aspiration to what we might and still become. But loyalty to a constitutional order is not only a matter of the head, but of the heart. It's not only a matter of principles and ideas, but it is an ethos. Or as I put it in my book, American patriotism comprises elements of both logos, or reason, and ethos. I'll explain what I mean by that term in a sec. It requires an understanding of patriotism as what Tocqueville called a habit of the heart. An ethos is not just a manner of thinking, but of feeling. This suggests that patriotism is something connected to our moral sentiments and dispositions, our sensibilities. Tocqueville's appeal to the heart was clearly drawing on the work of an earlier French philosopher, Blaise Pascal, who believed that knowing is a matter of both faith and reason. The heart, he wrote, has its reasons that reason does not know. In other words, patriotism requires both reason and you might say it requires both sense and sensibility. This concept of ethos, that patriotism is an ethos, is, an ancient, is, it, is also an ancient one. It comes from the Greek word for habit or character. The pre-Socratic philosopher Heraclitus remarked, the ethos of a man is his destiny, suggesting that character is fate. And the ethos of a society embodies those traits of character that are looked up to as normative by the community. Regarding certain character traits as admirable or worthy of emulation, every regime implicitly admits the superiority of some specific human type, whether this be the aristocrat, the priest, the warrior, the entrepreneur, or the common man. The ethos describes the character or tone of a society what it finds worthy of admiration, or what it looks up to. This is not to say that any 
community will be composed of identical human types, but they will possess certain distinct features that form a kind of national character. This is what enables us to select certain character types when we say of somebody or something that it is typically American. How, how do we say, why do we say that, or what enables us to say? Because it shares a common shape or character or ethos that is immediately intelligible to us, immediately identifiable, sometimes to our discomfort when we see fellow countrymen, often foreign surroundings, where we identify them by the way they talk, gesticulate, their body language, and many other subliminal signals. But this idea that patriotism is an ethos, what I call here ethos patriotism, runs into a difficulty that I alluded to earlier. Doesn't loyalty to one's country, or one country, and one way of life, stand in contradiction with the principles of equality and moral inclusiveness that are also part of American patriotism? How can I regard all people as equal if my loyalties are to my country alone? Where is the line drawn between what we owe to fellow citizens and what we owe to fellow human beings who may be experiencing pain and suffering? This is a question, by the way, that is raised every year at Passover Seders when we ask the question, what do we owe the stranger? Some version of that question is obviously at the core of our current debates about border security and immigration. Are we at bottom a nation of immigrants who welcome the stranger, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free in Emmer Lazarus's phrase, or do we need a border wall as a way of protecting our national sovereignty? How broadly or narrowly do we define that line? In defining ourselves too broadly, we risk losing our ethos. In defining ourselves too narrowly, we risk losing our humanity. Sadly, or, or maybe not, there is no algorithm for solving that problem. It requires the kind of wisdom and prudent statesmanship that we have been lacking. The fear is that ethos patriotism leads to an insular vision of American life, to America as a kind of embattled fortress in a sea of moral and political chaos. And this is by no means an irrational fear. But nevertheless, loyalty to country does not require me to be indifferent, much less hostile to the needs of others. Loyalty to country is something like loyalty to family. This does not require me to think that my family is better than all others and to set it up in opposition to all others. What would that even mean? I may love my family best, but this does not require me to look down on or despise others. I may love it precisely because of its defects, not because it is best in some way. My preference for my child my wish to see him get into a good school, have a satisfying career, to prosper and succeed is not some immoral desire to see him win at all costs, much less that I should see others fail. I would rather be failing in my duty as a parent if I, if I were to regard his interests behind some kind of artificially imposed veil of ignorance. But likewise, I would be failing in my duty if I did not try to instill some notion of justice and fair play. And what is true about loyalty to family holds true for loyalty to larger units like states. Partiality for my own country, again, need not lead to indifference to others, except for times of war. Rarely do we feel ourselves locked into some kind of zero-sum game where what's good for one is bad for the other. There's nothing shameful at all about attending to our own interests first, the interests of American workers and farmers. In fact, I would argue we look after others better when we look after ourselves first. That's not a recipe for economic isolationism. Rather, it is a recognition that the well-being of our country, just like the well-being of our neighborhood, is dependent on the well-being of the people around us. Hillel's famous dictum, if I am not for myself, who will be for me, 
is not simply a statement of individual responsibility, but rather of social obligation that puts fellow citizens at the top of our list of moral priorities. Another fear is that ethos patriotism leads us to ignore past and present injustices, resulting in a kind of blind faith or blind loyalty. Again, this is a legitimate concern, but it is not necessarily the case. Patriotism, as I understand it, and as I argue at some length in the book, can in fact be critical and self-correcting. Consider only the case of Congressional Medal of Honor winners who had previously been overlooked due to their race. What is this but an expression of regret for our previous failures and a desire to enlarge who is considered part of the American family? No one ever doubted, for example, Ronald Reagan's patriotism, yet he apologized for the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. So patriotism, as I'm arguing, can be self-correcting. Patriotism is not simply my country right or wrong. It is a desire to see one's country live up to its high highest promises. This was the idea behind Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail, in which King appealed to the country to live up to its founding principles. Like Lincoln before him, he appealed to the Declaration of Independence as America's mission statement and his constant pole star. Even while protesting Southern segregation statutes, he did not lose faith in America and in its progressive aspirations. King's act of simple and dignified resistance, like that of Gandhi and Mandela, shows that patriotism can indeed be combined with self-criticism. I am reminded here of Lincoln's description of Americans is an almost chosen people. What a, what a wonderful phrase, an almost chosen people. The term almost suggesting that there is more work to be done, but that this work is not based on a repudiation of what we are, but rather a call to live up to what is best in our traditions. Lincoln, like King, Gandhi, and Mandela later, what were what the political theorist Michael Walzer called connected critics because their criticism was premised on a prior set of loyalties. Their protests appealed to what is best in their traditions, not to what is worst. Critique is best exercised when it grows out not of detachment and resentment, but of care and love. This is an example from which I think many of today's social justi justice activists might take a lesson. Things have not always been this way. Colleges and universities were once considered the custodians of our most important civic values. Fields like history, political science, and literature were thought to prepare one for a life of national service. Patriotism was not indoctrination into an ideology, but rather a component of an educated mind. The proper love of country, belong to a literary tradition that might include Shakespeare's great patriotic speech and Richard II, you remember this blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England. But in an American context would certainly include works like Benjamin Franklin's autobiography, Ralph Waldo Emerson's Self-Reliance, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, and F. Scott Fitzgerald's Great Gatsby all of which taught for generations, students of students, what it means to be an American. Today, we would, of course, enlarge that canon to include works by Frederick Douglass, James Baldwin, and Toni Morrison. At Yale, the university where I've taught for 35 years, we find ourselves constantly surrounded by plaques and memorials dedicated to the men and women who have given their lives for their country. A statue of Nathan Hale stands outside of Connecticut Hall. The great rotunda in Woolsey Hall has inscribed on its walls the names of every Yale graduate who has died in every war since the American Revolution, including those 
including, by the way, those who lost their lives fighting against the Union for the Confederacy. The Cenotaph at Beinecke Plaza commemorates Yaleys who gave their lives in World War I, and behind it, the names of the great battles are etched in the entrance to commons. Over Memorial Gate at Branford College, that I had the privilege to head for 15 years, is an inscription that reads, for God, for country, and for Yale. When students read this today, if, if they read it at all, it perhaps seems no more than a quaint reminder of the benighted past. But my point is that patriotism requires education. It is something that must be taught. It is not just something inscribed in our DNA or something that we can take for granted. It must be taught. And something that must be taught requires teachers. And if not, it degrades into its opposites. Today, it's necessary to recapture patriotism from the two contending dispositions that I mentioned earlier. Once again, those on the left have largely ignored when they have not been openly contemptuous of patriotism. They view any expression of national loyalty as an expression of racism and white supremacy. But if patriotism must be rehabilitated from those on the left, it must be recaptured from those on the right. For them, love of country is too often used as a cudgel to divide and separate us, to separate the ins from the outs. Among the new nationalists are people who see themselves at war with relativism, multiculturalism, and identity politics that they view as posing an existential threat to American character. The language of fear, invasion, and impurity remains a staple of this rhetoric. Whatever, I want to say, may be the sins of the multiculturalists, and there are many, I do not regard them as enemies of the people. We were at war in Germany, Japan, Korea, Vietnam, and Iraq. We are not at war with other Americans over their claims to cultural identity, whatever we might think. The language of culture war has turned patriotism into a game of capture the flag, where each side expresses feigned outrage at the moral idiocies of the other. <clears throat> the new illiberal democracies, as they're called, and the strong men who speak for them have effectively co-opted the language of patriotism and put it to work for their own causes. These nationalist movements have learned an important lesson. In order to, to defeat an enemy, you have to take a page from their book. So the nationalist right has learned to speak the language of the multicultural left. If minorities, they argue, have a right to their identity politics, why shouldn't white men Christian evangelicals, incels, and other groups that see themselves as politically and culturally disenfranchised. White nationalism is only the most recent and most toxic form of this grievance politics. Both of these extremes are dehumanizing. They are, mere, in fact, mirror images of one another. If patriotism misused can be harsh and punitive, at its best, it can be elevating and inspiriting. It would be easy, as we witness the rise of ethno-nationalism in various parts of the world, to reject patriotism as tainted with xenophobia, racism, and other forms of bigotry. But things are not that simple. These are not expressions of patriotism, but perversions of it. Patriotism is frequently presented as making sacrifices for one's country during times of war, and in the extreme case, the sacrifice of life itself. We all love movies like Steven Spielberg's Saving Private Ryan or Clint Eastwood's Flags of Our Fathers because they depict the heroism of men in battle making the ultimate sacrifice in times of war. This is true on extreme occasions, but patriotism involves certain small sacrifices. It is, in many cases, a kind of lowercase virtue. Sacrifices like wearing a mask or getting a vaccine to prevent a raging pandemic, not just for yourself, but for the health and safety of your family, friends, neighbors, and fellow citizens. If these sacrifices seem too much to ask, if they seem to violate your inviolable right to liberty, 
then I worry that you will be incapable of any greater sacrifice for the public good if and when it will be required. If you cannot think beyond yourself, then I'm not sure you can claim the title of patriot. These may be small gestures, but they point to something of much greater importance, like standing for the flag or, <clears throat> or the, the national anthem. These gestures indicate that we are part of the same moral ethos and share a common moral destiny. The patriotism is a matter of civility, respect for law, tolerance, and responsibility. These, as I've said, may all be lowercase virtues, but they are all virtues worth having and nourishing. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Um, I, I uh, highly recommend uh, the book. Um, you've got a taste of it, uh, but there's more of it um, uh, in, in this. Um, I wanted to start out by talking about the theme of our whole series this year mm. about renewing America's civic compact, which I think you address in the book and in your remarks now. Um, in the book, you talk uh, a bit about, uh, as you did tonight, um, this concept in the title of the book, Extremes, that, that there are intellectual and political extremes almost dominant in American life um, right now. And one of the dimensions of that is, uh, is that you call for us to be self-aware that no matter how educated we are, we can be pulled into these extremes. At one point, you referred to them as you know, bubbles, right? We've heard the self-sorting uh, bubbles. So could you talk with us a little bit about this, that pausing to think about patriotism in the way you're framing it could help everybody, and those in, on both extremes as well as in the middle, to, to th think about problem of going to extremes, of ten good ideas that can tend to go to extremes, and, and that we, we can actually use this subject as a way to, to renew or rebuild a healthier constitutional culture, a healthier civic culture. Well, I think, Paul, thanks, thanks for that question, and I think that it's absolutely right. Uh, this might sound like a very simple thought, and maybe it's something I should have uh, known a long time ago, but one of the things I, I learned from the great philosopher Isaiah Berlin is that all ideas, no matter how good they are, can lead to dangerous consequences. And it's true of every, every good idea can in some way flip into its, in, into its opposite in, in, a, in a certain sense. And I think that's sort of where, where we are now in many ways. I, ideas, I mean, we've always, obviously, it's part of conflict is a part of political life. And politics is a matter of managing, the art of, of managing conflict. It was known to everybody from Aristotle on. Uh, the difference, it seems to me, is that extremes, which, again, just precisely because they were extremes, which were somewhat on the margins of our political life, have moved increasingly to occupy the center, or have increasingly occupied a much larger space in our political life, squeezing the center in a way that I find unique in my my experience in my 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 lifetime. Uh, the book was largely written with the idea that you know the hope that there remains. Uh, it, is, it is a hope. Uh, I think it's grounded in fact, but it is a hope that there remains a kind of core consensus in American life 
that extends from the, you know, let's call the center left to the center right. And that those kind of a, a decent constitutionalism is still possible. But all of the energy, all of the energy is coming from, from, from the extremes. Uh, on campuses, uh, patriotism, again, patri people, students who might want to express patriotism are intimidated by being called out and being, being seen uh, as racist or, or something. And then, of course, what happens is the loudest and most obnoxious voices you know, ocup occupy the, the, the conversation. How to reclaim? How to reclaim that? I wish I knew. I wish I had a formula for that, or I, I wish I knew how to do it. I wrote this book with the idea that maybe it will help to address. You know, the, we all we all hope when you write a book, we all hope it will be read by everybody. Because we're always disappointed in, in a way. But I, I wrote it with the hope that it would would speak to people who might use it to rec reclaim the voice of patriotism. Not not either use it to uh, as a cudgel, but also on the other side, not, do, not run away from it and to, to embrace a kind of love of country and American exceptionalism. I'm, I'm reminded uh, of the, isn't it, isn't it uh, another, another great political scientist, Samuel Huntington, who writes about America. America is a disappointment, but it's only a disappointment because it's a hope, mm -hmm. right? That we, ha we, we have these ideals and then we constantly argue, are we living up to them or are we? Well, well, Huntington's, uh, I mean, I mentioned Huntington in the book, his, his book, The Promise of Disharm, what was it? The Promise it is, it's of from that one. I think it was one of book. the great books of American politics. I recommend it to all, all students here. I think it should be, you know, it's not as widely read today, I think, as, as, it, as it used to be. But Huntington, Huntington was, had a great sense of, of the way in which America is a society Governed by a kind of constant disappointment because it and it, because it's a creedal, he says a creedal country, and there are moments of what he calls creedal passion where people realize we've, we're failing to live up to the creed. It gives rise to a period of uh, turmoil and, and conflict, and then that kind of abides or abates for a while, and then it comes up, and it's a kind of recurring pattern. And, and American political life, and I think there's something profoundly true in, in Huntington's, Huntington's conception of, of, of the American uniqueness in that yeah. way. Yeah. I mean, we are, I, I don't, I, you know, the only, it's a hard, it's a strong point to make. I'm sure I'll be corrected by somebody <laughs> if I say the only, but we are, uh, a, you know, we do have a creed, an American, uh, a, there is a kind of American creed set out in our founding documents, and that define us as a people. And I'm not sure that that's true of, of most other countries. Uh, maybe, maybe you see it in France, too. It's uh, also a country founded in a republic and you know, a constitution and so on, but it's had a much more troubled history yes. in certain respects. Yeah. Uh, but there are very few countries that can claim to be founded in a certain way on a creed. That, that's what makes America unique. It's what makes American patriotism unique because we, we go back to our founding for its for our principles. They're not just being reinvented all the time. Mm -hmm. So I, I did bring up on stage really another prop in addition to your book, which is uh, I hope everyone, I hope we have enough of them. We, we produce a pocket constitution in the school, and I showed it to you last night. We, we add to the Declaration and the Constitution two figures you mentioned, Abraham Lincoln, Gettysburg Address, 1863, and then Martin Luther King, 1963, the I Have the Dream Address. So my next question for you is about a theme you mentioned, education. I mean, we, we are offering this to our students yeah. and to anybody who comes to our events. As a kind of civic education, this is a little packet of American political ideals but also political history, you know, right. great, great documents, great, great statesmen. So uh, you know, civics or civic education, it's sort of, I, I think of it as, as something like, a, for many Americans, it's a visit to the dentist. It's something you know you should do, but you really don't want to. You think, I've already had enough of it, haven't I? You know? But you, your book is trying, I think, to a, to a mature audience say, this is very intellectually exciting, this idea of thinking about America 
of thinking about patriotism. It doesn't have to be just passion. Right. And it doesn't have to be the view that if you're really smart, you're beyond that. You're, you're, you've grown up and you're more sophisticated. Uh, that the thinking about our ideals and our history and great statesmen and our constitution, that th this is a civics, uh, it's a civic education, but it's not, it's not boring and it's not rote and it's not about a backward. Yeah. So could you talk a about that? Absolutely right. Um, you know, I grew up at a time when, you know, there was a requ required civics course in middle school or high school. And that, that course was always like the worst course you, you took. I mean, it was just it's utter, utterly boring. And the, the people who taught it were bored with it. And that's why kind of, I think that's in part why civics education in high school sort of disappeared. Um, two of the people who helped to, uh, this isn't a, quite on the topic of civic education, but I think it's connected. I want to go back to this. Who I think helped to revive the serious interest in the American idea, American founding principles and ideas, were two historians. One was a man named Bernard Balin at Harvard, taught a, wrote a very important book about the American Revolution. And the other, his student, Gordon Wood, who's gone on to become very famous over the years, has written many, many books about the revolutionary, colonial, and early Republican period. They showed that America, the American founding was, was really a founding of ideas and a clash of ideas. And it, it, may, it brought a kind of drama to the way in which American history, you, you could study American history. Wow, you could see this, this is a clash of ideas. People really cared about things. And of course, there are viewed many, there are many other iterations of this by other political theorists and historians. But uh, I've always thought that if we could do more of that, not just in, in like the kind of program you're running here, that's being run here, but in colleges, but also in high schools, to show if that would be possible to introduce stu high school students to primary texts, to have them read the Declaration, have them read some Federalist papers. That's, I don't think, beyond the, the ken of you know, most high school students. To, to show them, look at, look at some primary, look, what, look at the debates that the, they, they were having. It would be a way of instilling a much greater sense, not just not simply of patriotism, but I guess it would be a, but a kind of respect for the founding. It's so easy to dismiss this. Oh, uh, they, they, they lived in a primitive age. It was just about uh, domination. No, re read the text themselves, and you see a much richer, deeper, deeper and richer appreciation for political life. And that's what I wish we could, wish we could do, institute a kind of reading of primary documents and start that in high schools and yeah. carry it and carry it on in colleges. It's not really carried on as it should be in, in our universities and colleges. Yeah. yeah. I remember when we, we, we have a civic classics collection, uh, we have some uh, posters up about uh, one of the extraordinary items we have, a first printing of the Federalist from, from uh, 1788. And uh, but I remember being struck, we required some uh, text by Martin Luther King, his first two books inscribed by him, and doing some research and reminding myself that he invoked the Declaration and the Constitution in that great mm -hmm. 1963 address, standing on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. And then I discovered that in the, what, what was his last address, the night before he's assassinated, he invoked the Declaration and the Constitution again, in a sort of a sermon from a, from a pulpit. So he was critical of America in many ways, a disappointment, right? But it's because he knew, you know, he knew, he was very well educated, right. he knew these documents, he knew these ideals, he was calling all of us to, to live up. So it's this combination of love, but argument, mm -hmm. right? Is it? Very it's important right. to it. Yeah. yeah. Um, could we talk, uh, this is my, my last question, and then those of you in the audience who have questions, get ready to go. Could we talk a little bit about this um, theme of finding a reasonable middle ground, mm -hmm. right? You said Aristotle, yeah. that, that patriotism as an American patriotism, an enlightened, reflective, <clears throat> rational patriotism is a, is a virtuous mean between these extremes. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, if, I wanted to ask you about this extraordinary moment we're having, tw 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. Um, what, what does it mean to try to commemorate those attacks and to think as co in common as American mm -hmm. patriots about what we're grateful for uh, as Americans w without claiming that America is, is, uh, is perfect or, or, uh, right. or beyond debate? Well, I hate to think it takes an event like 9-11 to inspire people's patriotism, although it sometimes does. Um, you know, 9-11, you know, the, the, the two events that I will always remember, you know, you say we always remember where we were, and that it was, was when, I, when I was a child, I heard about the assassination of JFK, and then than 9-11. It's hard for me to believe that freshmen are starting college this year who were born after 9-11. You know, it, it, it seems like yesterday in, in, in a certain respect. And I, I remember um, in the, you know, maybe a month or so after the event, we, we live in Connecticut. We live about a 90 minutes from New York. So we we drove for the first time after 9-11 into the city uh, to look and also, you know, to go to a restaurant because, you know, just like today during the pandemic, they were suffering. So we thought in a small way we, we would do something. And I remember walking through the streets of lower Manhattan near Greenwich Village and seeing flags flown from, from apart, apartment buildings. When, when, do you see, when do you see that? You know, <laughs> when have you seen that? It was very, it was very touching, a very moving ex experience just to see that and to recognize. We, we couldn't go, and no one was allowed to go near the, the site, but we were in the lower area. Uh, I, I hate to think it, it takes this, but it, it is a, commemora a moment of commemoration, and uh, maybe it w maybe it will bring it will bring some reflection. Maybe it will bring some reflection. Um, Good. Well, we have a microphone set up for questions uh, from the audience. Uh, we, we ask that you pose brief questions to Stephen Smith. Uh, there are two parts to that. Please do ask a question rather than make a statement. And please do be somewhat brief so we can get in it. Uh, you know, uh, I've been sitting there trying to form a question <laughs> okay. because I have so many things going on in my mind. I think, as you can see, I am African American. So I have lived the African American experience. And I think my question would be when. Do we, Hispanics, Native Americans, immigrants, and women get there, get to where white people, and I'm going to say people because there are many white mm -hmm. women that are there. For instance, I grew up in South Phoenix, segregated. South Mountain High School, the South Mountain Rebels, they didn't give a crap about black people going there and this little white rebel man running around. Anyway, so again, my question is, when do we get there? I watched this with white resentment begin mm -hmm in the 60s with equal opportunity. Mm -hmm. I sat up, I was a high school counselor, and I sat up when they showed this video. And already, when we were talking about equal opportunity, white people were beginning to write term papers of how to avoid hiring blacks. Mm -hmm. Et cetera, et cetera. So, I'm going to get there. How many of you in the audience have ever heard of free, white, and 21? So you'll have to you'll have to speak in the audience into the microphone. But I'll okay. give you one, I'll get one last chance here. To, to, so the question the question is, you, your premise is, 
racially, America is not equal. A whole group Absolutely of not. people are not equal. So the question to Stephen is, how, how could people when who are do, feeling when... marginalized be patriotic? Is that the question? Yes. Okay, good. Because I was before Kaepernick. I stopped saying the flag salute because I don't have mm -hmm. equality. Okay, so let's give Stephen okay. a chance. You know, I very much appreciate that question and the experience, your experience that behind it. When you ask when will we get there, I mean, uh, obviously you don't expect me to give you a date when, when we will get there. It, it, it will be, it, it is and will be an ongoing struggle to achieve a certain kind of racial equality in America. Is, I'm 79. Right. And my great-grandfather was a slave. Mm. Well, I, I, I think <laughs> that's, a, that's an extraordinary arc that you, you just painted of your, of your just given in your family. I, I would say from your grandfather that we, we've, we've seen progress. We've seen progress. Now, right, are we, are we the kind of, have we achieved the kind of racial equality and respect that I think people in this, I, I and people in it, no, no, we haven't we we have failed but we're, we're we're struggling with it we're trying I think we're doing I like to think we're doing better like every like everything else in life you move forward a bit you you, you end up going back a bit but hopefully we, we we move forward I I think we I think we do and I I think without that hope I mean my book ends by the way with a discussion of hope and democratic hope I think hope is a virtue of a, a in many ways, a peculiar virtue of democratic societies. We, we, we can't exist without, without, without a kind of hope. It's, it's, like, a, it's like a faith, per, perhaps. Uh, it may not be, it's hard to say what the ground of that hope is, but without hope, what, what, what else do we have? So I, 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 wa I want to be optimistic on this while, while acknowledging the, 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 the the pain and the difficulty of achieving the kinds of things you, you are addressing. Okay. You'll have to speak into the microphone oh. so that everyone can hear you. Some of you might know Dr. Morrison Warren. He was one of the first black instructors here at the university. He played football for ASU, et cetera, et cetera. And he said to my husband and me, how long ago was it that? Maybe 10 years ago. We were sitting down eating, and he said to my husband and me, one of the worst things that African Americans ever did was to desegregate. Mm. Okay. Next question. So, good day, uh, Professor. So. I would like to raise uh, a counter to your is Aristotelian distinction that you give to patriotism as the middle virtue. And in fact, I would argue it is indeed nationalism that is the middle virtue, with its far extremes being multiculturalism and rabid xenophobia. And I would posit this for the precise reason that the state exists to distinguish friend from enemy, servants of Leviathan to servants of other Leviathans. Whereas patriotism is in fact still disvirtue on account of the fact that it allows components of multiculturalism to still inhabit within the state, thereby fertilizing the soil for those components within the nation to infest and rot at the core. Thus, it would, I think it's fair to say that it is monocultural dominance that is necessary and that without such, you will invariably only see what we are seeing at present, a multiplication of fifth columns within the state ever eroding present circumstances. Uh, that brilliantly restates what you've just said, the thesis of a famous German political theorist and legal philosopher named Carl Schmitt, who defined politics more or less exactly along the lines that you did. It's, it, politics is a question of distinguishing us from them. It is a question of uh, who, who gets to determine who's in and, and who's out. Uh, 
that, that is exactly the, the view of politics that uh, I'm, my book is, uh, my, my book opposes. I, I think it's, I, I should say, I think it's highly un-American, but uh, our country's not based on a, we're, we're based on an idea of de the Declaration of Independence, an idea of rights. It's not a question of creating friends and enemies in which to d distinguish ourselves. So I think you should read a little more Jefferson and a little less Schmidt. You could begin by reading that he discusses yeah. Schmidt at length, and, yeah. uh, and so he, he does take that, that I mean, view. I mean, let me just say one, one other thing about the nationalism, patriotism thing. Uh, I remember it was like three years ago, I think, when Emmanuel Macron said at the um, um, Armistice Day that he said patriotism and nationalism are the opposites. And I think he, he misstated that, or he didn't misstate it. I, I don't think that's true. They're not opposites. Patriotism and nationalism grow out of a common root in many ways. As I said earlier, desire to have your country, your culture, your way of life respected and strong. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a perfectly legitimate desire. I think beginning with a common root, patriotism and nationalism move, they're, they're branches that move in, in different directions. Uh, patriotism speaks a language of, of respect and uh, loyalty and respect, as well as self-criticism. Nationalism has come to speak the language of resentment and fear. It was not always that way, to be sure. In the 19th century, liber patriotism and liberalism and nationalism went, went hand in hand. It's in the 20th that they've, they've tended to diverge. And I think in the last few years, we've seen, we've seen this nationalism, which was sort of, for many years, sort of uh, on, the, on the back burner of, of public life. It's acquired a new zeal of the kind you just expressed that I think is becoming deeply toxic in our environment. Next question, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Professor. I found that to be a um, very enlightening discussion. But I have a question of how your ideas are supposed to, on patriotism, are supposed to be applicable to. Just step into the um, microphone uh, a little bit. Um, yeah. how, how, how the um, ideals of patriotism are supposed to be applicable to mm -hmm. countries other than the U.S. and these non-creedal countries. Mm -hmm. For example, how are countries such as the, where I'm from, like, okay, um, for example, like I'm part, um, I'm part Czech, I'm part Croatian. Mm -hmm. How, actually for um, the Croatia and Yugoslavia, and now in the Taliban, which is also very ethnically, mm -hmm. um, very ethnically divided, um, what is supposed to unite these countries? And is patriotism yeah. only uh, valuable in countries that, um, where, we, where we have a, um, a set like known values, yeah. like we have, a, like it's literally written down in the Declaration of Independence. And what about countries that do have values, but we don't think they're particularly good values, such as the Taliban claims to be, yeah. the, like they're authentically good values, like this, this radical medieval, I mean, some right. medieval people were good, like Thomas Aquinas. He was great, but um, I guess what we would say medieval, like in that in, in the uh, oppressive sense. Um, okay. Uh, you know, thanks first. Thank you for that. It, it's a question I struggled with in writing the book, and it's a question that I have been been asked before, and I'm, I'm going to give you. Uh, an honest but probably unsatisfactory answer to your question. Uh, I did not write the book as a kind of um, one-size-fits-all patriotism. I, I can't speak, I, I can only speak, I only attempted to speak for the American experience in this book. And I do talk about what makes America different. I, I realize the ideas I'm talking about in the book are not easily translatable to other societies that have different, different kinds of political traditions, different histories, different cultures, and, and the like. It's not something that patriotism is, 
I, I was really talking about what is in many ways special, I, in my view, about, about the American experience. I think other countries, you know, in we'll have to we'll have to work on that them, themselves. I, I I would I would lo I would love for that to happen. I I would love to see a school of you know comparative patriotisms. You know what 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 might patriotism look like in in other countries and in other places. But I I just don't know enough. I didn't know enough to to be and I and I didn't want to put myself in the pun position of pontificating for, I mean, there's nothing more obnoxious than a pontificating for other pe you know, what other people should, should be doing. They'll have to work that out. I'm barely, I can barely talk about our own experience. But thank you, thank you for, for that. I, I appreciate it. Next question. Uh, good evening, gentlemen. So in uh, your closing remarks, you mentioned something about uh, patriotism being a respect for law. Mm -hmm. But how does that relationship work with laws that go against our values? Like we were talking about segregation, uh, the Japanese internment, and then even like going into today with, you know, like work being done against the Second Amendment and such. Right. At what point is it more patriotic to break the law versus to respect it? Do you think? <clears throat> well, you ask that you ask a tough question. Uh, I mean, I think the the answer is you you. You work is in the case of segregation laws in the South. You you struggle and in, in the North too. You 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 struggle and work to fight fight against them. I mean you don't you don't you don't give you don't give up the you don't give up the fight. And I think patriotism is certainly compatible with with various forms of civil resistance and, and, and civil resistance of kind of the kind I, I, I talk about in the book. Um, I'm not a big, I, I mean, I'm not a big one for illegality. I mean, it's just, you know, it doesn't speak to me. I, I don't think it, it helps, uh, you know, breaking the law. I mean, protest isn't illegal, clearly. Maybe some would like to make it illegal, but it's not, not illegal yet. Uh, protest is fine. I, I'm, I'm a, I oppose uh, breaking the law. And my model for that, in many ways, is Lincoln. Lincoln's uh, his uh, er, very early speech on something called the Lyceum Address, where he addresses the question of lawless lawlessness, the, da the dangers of lawlessness. It's not because he didn't think that people could protest, but lawlessness creates disorder. Disorder breeds a kind of contempt for law, and I think the result of that is not going to be the improvement of the situation, but it will and be lead to a kind of general moral chaos and breakdown. So these are just my my view my views on it. You know my my my, my views. I mean, when I was in college, I protested the Vietnam War, and it was very important. It was a very important part of my adolescence and. Or early early adulthood. I mean, it made a, a huge impression on me. So I, I'm going to be the last person to oppose protest, but I'm against illegal Ill, illegality and law breaking and violence. I, I, that's that that I think is self self destructive and self defeating. Thanks so much for that. Thank you. Just yeah. a footnote on that that the, the that address is from 1838, so it's it's two decades before Civil War. Yeah breaks out and Lincoln yeah. is warning, he uses the word actually suicide, mm. right? America would never be conquered by a foreign power, some Napoleon, right? If America dies, we will die by suicide. And the root issue was more passion than reason mm -hmm. and, yeah. and a, a, a culture of righteous lawlessness. Uh, uh, and so his, and his remedy was education and the laws and yeah. the Constitution. <laughs> right. <clears throat> Uh, so today we are we are somewhat removed from what Tocqueville uh, called the trials of freedom, meaning uh, sort of contending with local decentralized politics, gaining experience and respect for such an environment and principles. Uh, today, social media favors national news, national political development, um, and not state level, township level politics. Um, they're not given the same attention. Uh, do you see this as sort of a, a first cause or problem relating to our, our overall lack of interest? Uh, in patriotism, or at least for the younger generations, this sort of 
we, we're no longer involved with these the, the important trials of freedom. At the local level, you're, lo, level you're talking. Is that what you mean by yes. the trials of freedom at the local level? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think that's a good point. I, it, it's not one that I dwelled upon in the book particularly. I'll, I'll, I'll have to think about that. Uh, to what degree? I mean, uh, as, as politics has become increasingly nationalized and lo local, the spirit of localism is not as robust. Although, if you live in Connecticut, you would think it, it is, but that's another story. Uh, but uh, yeah, okay, I'll point. Point. I, I don't really have a response, but point, point well taken. I'm going going to going to think about that one. Thanks for bringing that up. Last question. Um, do you have anything to say to people who find themselves sort of? politically and patriotically fatigued, um, torn between seemingly two extremes on the national level? Meaning par party extremes, or which extremes? Uh, party extremes and sort of correspondingly the patriotic extremes that he discussed in his speech. So when you say fatigued, say, give me another sentence or two. What do you mean by fatigued? Um, I think many people who would consider themselves in the center politically um, and patriotically, as you described, find themselves torn between two choices of political um, division yeah. on either end. And so the, the fatigue means you might just check out and try to forget politics and forget yes. that. Yeah. Well, I think the book was written in part with, with that sort of premise in mind, uh, I, I, uh, we, we can't afford to be, we can't afford to check out. I mean, it's one, one, one answer to that is we just, we just can't afford to, as much as we would like to, you know, tend our garden, if, in that, that expression, to just, you know, be above it or let say it'll work. It's, it won't. It won't. If if thoughtful people aren't committed to helping, then the worst then the worst ones will will win. Will win, and we just can't we just can't afford that. So I sh certainly share your sense of moral frustration and fatigue. But don't let it don't let it be don't let it overwhelm you. You need to carry on the fight. Carry on the fight. Don't 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 give up. Don't give up. Be why do I say that? Because I believe, and it, it is a hope. I believe our side will win. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. You're not yeah. so fatigued, right? <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, I just have a few closing uh, remarks before we say thank you to, to Stephen Smith. Uh, there are quite a few students here. Most of the students, uh, most of the questioners were were yeah. uh, students at the university. Uh, so please do get some information that we have outside about the school, not just the pocket constitution, but other information uh, out there about uh, our courses and our, our programs and our uh, speaker events. Please, everybody, please pick up the uh, schedule of other events this fall in the Civic Discourse uh, Project and just keep in touch with us. We will have a conference in uh, February that we're uh, planning for, so we'll have events in the spring semester as well. Coming ahead just this semester, <clears throat> in early October, we have H.R. McMaster talking about national security as a civic education, uh, well, sorry, civic education as a national security issue. We have Jonathan Rauch in late October talking about, in a way, the, the, soft, the civic software of, of knowledge and truth that's part of our constitutional uh, order. And then in November, we have uh, the first of a sort of sub-series on race in America called Can We Talk Honestly About Race? And it's gonna be Glenn Lowry of Brown University and Khalil Muhammad of Harvard University in a dialogue debate about, about race and justice issues in America. So that's just this semester. Uh, I have thanks to say just quickly to, uh, I mentioned Arizona PBS earlier, but uh, say thanks to our team within the school that plans all of these uh, events. I'm just the pretty face here uh, up front. There's an enormous amount of work that goes into these live uh, events. So I want to say especially thanks to Dr. Carol McNamara, who's Associate Director of the School, 
for public programs. Uh, the rest of our communications and uh, events team, Morgan Raddick, who's our events coordinator, uh, other staff uh, colleagues, including uh, Marcia and JC, uh, and our uh, student workers. I hope you will stay for our reception. We have a few uh, things for you. I hope to see you at future events uh, in the school. If you did enjoy this event, uh, uh, we have other events in our video archive from the past four years of programs like this. You can look for those on our school website or on our YouTube channel. We also have a podcast, which we're starting again, called Keeping It Civil. We have episodes from the past several years, and we will be doing, uh, I think Stephen will do a podcast with us and other speakers this year. So look for that, Keeping It Civil, wherever you find uh, podcasts. And with that, please join me in giving a, a round of thanks, uh, applause to Stephen Smith. Thank you so much. In a way, that was the perfect final question, you know. Can, yeah, it was, yeah, it was nice. Can yeah. I just lose faith? Yeah.